Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We are getting a clearer picture of the role that the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Ginny Thomas, played in the right-wing ecosystem. She's functioned as a key link between the furthest fringes of the conspiracy theory-believing right and the absolute centers of power, including not just the Supreme Court, but also the White House. New reporting from the Daily Beast reveals that Ginny Thomas, a longtime conservative activist, would regularly go to the White House, that's during the Trump years, and make, quote, insane hiring and firing recommendations to then-President Donald Trump. She would show up for White House meetings, quote, armed with written memos of who she and her allies believe Trump should hire for plum jobs and who she thought Trump should promptly purge. According to a former, former senior Trump administration official, quote, we all knew that within minutes after Ginny left her meeting with the president, we would, he would start yelling about firing people for being disloyal. When Ginny Thomas showed up, you knew your day was wrecked. Another former official describes Thomas's memos as, and I quote here, dripping with paranoia and read like they were written by a disturbed person. Okay, step back for a second. Um, Ginny Thomas would regularly just show up at the White House. She would meet with the President of the United States, and she would tell him who he, she thought he should fire and hire, which, of course, prompts the question, how did someone like this end up with that much power in the first place? It is hard to get White House meetings. It's hard to get FaceTime with the President. Ginny Thomas is the kind of person who was able to get that. And she has, I have to say, a fascinating backstory. In some ways, I think, a microcosm of a certain generation of conservatives. So she comes from a deeply conservative family in Omaha, Nebraska. In fact, uh, somewhat coincidentally, writer Kurt Anderson recalls growing up across the street from her. Quote, my parents, Goldwater Republicans, always disparage her parents as John Birchers, referring to the far-right John Birch Society. Ginny Thomas began her career in conservative politics in the early 1980s, was working for a Republican congressman when she became involved in, well, a cult known as LifeSpring. In 1987, the Washington Post reported extensively about LifeSpring, which trained members in a series of expensive courses and cited experts, quote, who believe LifeSpring is a dangerous company that uses psychological tricks to manipulate minds. Jane Thomas spoke to the Post for that article, telling them that she was confused and troubled by exercises, such as one in which trainees listened to The Stripper while disrobing to skimpy bikinis and bathing suits. The group then stood in a U-shaped line, made fun of fat people's bodies, and riddled one another with sexual questions. Thomas said it took her months to break fully from LifeSpring's, quote, high-pressure tactics. I had intellectually and emotionally gotten myself so wrapped up with this group, I was moving away from my family and friends, the people I work with. My best friend came to visit me, and I was preaching at her, using that tough attitude they teach you. She went on to describe hiding out in another part of the country to avoid constant phone calls from fellow trainees who were taught that it was their responsibility to make Thomas keep her commitment to life's right. Now, in 1986, after she escaped the cult and was deprogrammed, Jane Thomas spoke at an event for former cult members. And it's really um, gripping uh, testimony. She, she described the very real psychological challenge of not being overly drawn into fighting the cult as a kind of replacement for the cult itself. Hi, I was in Life Spring and I was what I considered to be deprogrammed. And I guess coming out of, when we talk about it, the focus of this discussion is on coming out of a cult. There were a number of things that went on for me. When you come away from a cult, you have to find a balance in your life as far as getting involved with fighting the cult or exposing it. And kind of the other angle is getting a sense of yourself and what was it that um, made you get into that group and, and what's, what open questions are there that still need to be answered. And I think I'm really trying, I'm struggling with a balance between that. I want to expose life spring. I want to keep other people from going through that experience. But I also uh, don't want to go overboard in that regard. So all those things that got me to life spring are still there. And I guess I struggle with not going overboard and fighting a cult, but I know that's important too. <laughs> Now, the year after that video was filmed, again, very self-aware, very uh, compelling, uh, raw, emotional testimony there. The year after that was filmed, Ginny married her current husband, Clarence Thomas. He was then the chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. 
Now, Thomas was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1991 to replace, of course, Justice Thurgood Marshall. He's now the longest serving member of the court and one could argue the most influential member of the court. Jenny Thomas continued to work in conservative politics for the Heritage Foundation during the George W. Bush administration, later founding a lobbying group. In 2020, Jenny Thomas made headlines of her own when Anita Hill revealed that Thomas had left her a voicemail asking for an apology. Now, for context, Hill accused Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment during his confirmation hearings, somewhat famously, back in 1991. So Jenny Thomas called Anita Hill asking for an apology nearly 20 years after the fact. And now you've likely seen Ginny Thomas's name in the news again. Again, not because she's the wife of Clarence Thomas. No, because the Washington Post obtained copies of messages that had been turned over to the January 6th committee, revealing that Ginny Thomas sent former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows a barrage of texts in the weeks after the 2020 election, urging him to try to overturn the results. She was pro-coup. She referred to wild far-right conspiracy theories, sending Meadows a link to an absolutely just insane YouTube video that's since been taken down, which was centered around a fake QAnon conspiracy theory referencing a Trump sting. The video was by a far-right commentator who also claimed that Sandy Hook massacre was a false flag. After she texted that video to Meadows, Thomas added, quote, I hope this is true. She also sent Meadows a passage that had circulated on right-wing websites claiming, quote, Biden crime family and ballot fraud co-conspirators are being arrested and detained for ballot fraud right now and over coming days and will be living in barges off Gitmo to face military tribunals for sedition. Jane Thomas has also come under scrutiny for endorsing the rally that preceded the insurrection on January 6th, writing on Facebook that morning, quote, watch MAGA crowd today, love MAGA people. Thomas admits that she attended that rally herself although she says she left before Donald Trump began speaking. Because of all this, because the wife, a sitting Supreme Court justice, was knee-deep in the big lie the election was stolen, actively texting Trump's chief of staff, urging him to be more vociferously pro-coup, and because Clarence Thomas, in his role as Supreme Court justice, already participated in two cases relating directly to the 2020 election and the January 6th insurrection, including being the lone dissenter arguing the Trump White House records should not be sent to the January 6th committee, records which could have included his own wife's texts. Because of all that, because of the manifest and obvious conflict of interest, there are calls for Clarence Thomas to resign. There's a letter from members of Congress demanding, at the least, he recuse himself from any upcoming 2020 election cases. And so now the January 6th committee is reportedly preparing to request an interview with Ginny Thomas. There's a way you could say that Ginny Thomas is now the member of, well, another cult, or at least a totalizing belief system, if you want to be charitable, which is that of Donald Trump. But even before Trump, Ginny Thomas's politics were very clear. She has been a member of the conservative movement for many years. And there have long been people who scrutinize the Thomases for that, as well as those who ask the question of what her work has to do with her husband. Ginny and Clarence Thomas have often called themselves a team. Listen to how Justice Thomas put it in 2018 in an interview for his wife's online series. And the best part of being a justice? It's first of all, it's, um, it'd be impossible without you. I'm, I have to be honest. I mean, it would be, um, it's sort of like, how do you run with one leg? You can't. I mean, the, um, it makes it whole when I have my wife. It's a very sweet and genuine sentiment about a married couple. It's impossible to ignore the fact that Jenny Thomas has power in Washington in some non-measurable degree to which because of her, who her husband is. He's one of the most important conservatives in all of Washington. And this is not my speculation. As Jonathan V. Lass put it recently in The Bulwark, quote, the only reason she was texting the president chief of staff instead of being the angry cat lady on Facebook is because she married a man who got himself appointed to the Supreme Court. But again, this is not an outlier, Jane Thomas. Her views are not outlier views. It's embedded in the nature of the modern conservative movement. And even if Trump isn't president, president that's the point, because MAGAism... That belief system, that totalizing belief system, 
is still just a step away from power. We got the juggler. We went for the juggler. And we went for the top dog because we want every other industry, every other uh, business to know that uh, things have changed. We're going we to unionize. We're not going to quit our jobs anymore. So the first union in American history. Yeah. Let's go! Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got to thank Amazon because they made this all possible. <laughs> Today, Amazon workers at a Staten Island warehouse successfully voted to unionize. That is the first time that has ever happened at any of the company's U.S. facilities. It may be one of the biggest wins for organized labor in a generation. And it was a battle that was fought tooth and nail. It's not the only Amazon warehouse trying to unionize right now, as we've covered here on the show before. In Bessemer, Alabama, Alabama, they just had a do-over election after the first was invalidated. The results are still too close to call, with over 400 contested ballots remaining. Now, in response to the successful election in New York, Amazon issued a statement that reads in part, quote, we're disappointed with the outcome of the election in Staten Island because we believe having a direct relationship with the companies is best for our employees. They also indicated they're considering filing objection based on what they say they saw as undue influence by the National Labor Relations Board, among other options. But this comes amid an incredible shift towards labor militancy across the country. And this victory against Amazon could spell a broader shift in the long decline of organized labor here in the U.S. Derek Palmer is one of the people who played a key role in winning that vote. He's the vice president of the Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island, and he joins me now. Derek, it's, it's great to talk to you. I know you guys are celebrating, and you're nice enough to take a little time to talk to us tonight. First, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling excited. You know, this is one of the greatest moments of my life, honestly. How did this, how, if people say to you, how did this happen? This is people have tried. Amazon fought tooth and nail. They spent $4 million, I think, uh, in, in trying to make this not happen. What was the key to success here? Um, well, I would say like our um, our direct approach that we have with workers. You know, um, we all Amazon workers um, organizing other Amazon workers. Um, so we understand their struggles. You know, uh, we can all relate to each other. So I think that's what was, um, that that's what made it successful. Yeah. And when you say that, I, I just want to put a fine point on this. Usually the way this happens is a union that exists will send professional organizers to help workers inside a place figure out how to put together a union. It's a difficult process. That was not the case here. This was entirely grassroots, entirely organic. You and, and Christian Smalls and a bunch of other people got together and just did this on your own, right? Yes, that's correct. And what what was it that made you feel like you were at a breaking point where you wanted to take this on? Uh, well, you know, I've been I'm um, employed with Amazon for over six years, and uh, you know, I've done everything um, as far as like um, meeting the goals and exceeding all the expectations. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I wasn't able to uh, move up within a company, um, and then someone who's been employed with the company about four months, you know, automatically moving up. Um, so that mixed with the, you know, the unsafe huh. conditions um, at, the condi at, the, at the warehouse are ultimately the reason why. Yeah, how much I know we had Chris Smalls, Christian Smalls on the, on the program before talking about the about the pandemic and, and, a, and a feeling during the pandemic that, you know, your, your safety, your health was at risk and that and that the company uh, really didn't see, seem sufficiently concerned about that. How important was that in the organizing effort? Um, yeah, you know, um, the pandemic played a, a key role. You know, um, we actually were able to use our cell phones um, in Amazon, which we normally aren't able to do. So that played uh, a key part of um, of organizing. They are saying, you know, they're 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 clearly Amazon corporate is clearly making uh, noises that they're going to challenge the result of this. They're going to fight you tooth and nail. Are you ready for further battles here? Oh, yeah. You know, we've been uh, technically battling with Amazon for about uh, two years now. Um, but, you know, we, this is something that we expected. Um, but, you know, at the end, at the end of the day, you saw the results. You know, we won by over 500 uh, votes. So I don't see how they, they their challenge is valid. But, you know, they're going to do what they have to do. And that's nothing that we're not prepared for. You, you still work there, right? Yes, I do. What's it like at work? I mean, how 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 fraught, how intense has this been during this period to go in there every day? Oh uh, well, you know, obviously, you know, um, myself, you know, being a leader um, of this movement, 
Um, you know, I'm very, I'm very vocal, you know, they, Amazon is well aware of my stance and, um, you know, it's, you know, obviously the management, you know, they look at me like a target. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I just want what's best for workers. So, so, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't ultimately intimidate me like it may other workers, but you know, that's, that's why, um, my, my presence in the building is so vital, you know, to this movement. All right, Derek Palmer, one of the uh, organizers uh, of what of the biggest labor victories, honestly, in a generation. People are saying that who are, you know, labor historians and 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 folks in the labor movement and people who are labor journalists. So congratulations uh, to you and all the folks there, Derek. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Chris. Appreciate you.